What is more terrifying for a cosmonaut? A spacecraft accident in orbit or an off-course landing in the impassable Siberian taiga where no one can find you? Under normal conditions, everything was under control. The landing point was known. Rescue teams were ready. But once the capsule strayed from its trajectory, the crew could end up in swamps, forests, or snow fields where no ordinary vehicle could reach. These incidents nearly cost cosmonauts their lives and forced the USSR to create a whole range of search and rescue vehicles, culminating in the Bluebird Complex, a machine capable of driving virtually anywhere. And that is no exaggeration. Watch until the end to learn the full story. Our story begins in 1965, when the crew of Voskhod II, Pavel Belyaev and Alexei Leonov, set out on their mission to orbit. On March 18th of that year, history was made. For the very first time, a human stepped into open space. That man was Soviet cosmonaut Alexei Leonov. His spacewalk came with unexpected challenges, but in the end it was a success. The real drama, however, began during the return to Earth. The capsule's automatic re-entry system failed, forcing Commander Belyaev to take manual control. Instead of landing on the familiar steps of Kazakhstan, where recovery teams were waiting, the spacecraft came down deep in the Ural Taiga. They were spotted from the air after three hours, but rescuers faced a serious problem. There was simply no way to reach them. No roads at all. The nearest settlement was 70 kilometers away, and no helicopter could land in the dense forest. The recovery operation dragged on for two full days. Exhausted by spaceflight and re-entry, the cosmonauts had to endure the freezing Siberian wilderness, with nothing but survival gear and their training to rely on. When they finally returned, Leonov and Belyaev were celebrated as heroes. After the Voskhod 2 incident, Sergei Korolev turned to Vitaly Grachev with a special request to design a vehicle that wouldn't just handle rough terrain, but could go absolutely anywhere, even through the Siberian taiga, across swamps, or over two meters of snow. At that time, Grachev headed the special design bureau of the Moscow Zill factory. This unit was essentially the Soviet Union's laboratory for off-road vehicles, creating experimental machines, extreme prototypes, and heavy military transports. Grachev himself was the driving force behind many of these designs, both a chief engineer and a visionary. Most of the Bureau's work focused on strictly military projects, multi-axle carriers, missile transporters, and massive army trucks. But this assignment was different. It wasn't about transporting missiles through the forest. For the first time, the goal was not hardware, but people, to ensure cosmonauts could be rescued even in the most difficult and remote conditions. The search for the optimal solution took years. Grachev and his team faced a difficult question. What should a true all-terrain vehicle look like? Should it run on wheels or tracks? Perhaps on motor wheels mounted on long suspension arms or even on pneumatic tracks? Rows of rollers linked together by a flexible belt? And if wheels were the answer, then what kind of tires? Aggressive treads, ultra-low pressure balloons, or inflatable rollers? Each worked brilliantly on some surfaces, but failed on others. Some proposals went even further, suggesting screw-propelled machines, giant rotating cylinders capable of grinding through snow and swamps, and in theory, even towing back an entire landing capsule. But what happens once the screws reach solid ground, where they cannot move at all? Tow the vehicle on a massive trailer? Wait for a helicopter? Such schemes looked overly cumbersome much like the enormous Zill 4904 prototype already built at the time. In parallel, 
The Bureau also pursued wheeled designs, simpler, more reliable, and easier to maintain. It was during this stage that the famous Grushev School of off-road engineering truly took shape. Its principles were clear. Minimum weight, the largest possible tires, maximum ground clearance, centralized tire pressure control, offset wheel gears, locked drive to all wheels, steering with both front and rear axles, independent torsion suspension, sealed brakes, a gasoline engine, and stable ultra-low crawling speeds. For Grachev, test failures were not setbacks, but discoveries. Each breakdown revealed the exact weak point to be reinforced, without adding unnecessary weight to the entire vehicle. As he liked to say, extra weight is always a burden. For the same reason, his bureau never equipped vehicles with self-recovery winches. A true all-terrain vehicle had to pull itself free, and if it couldn't, no winch would help. Almost all of the Bureau's prototypes were amphibious, and some could even travel on water at speeds exceeding 15 kilometers per hour, an impressive performance for machines of their size. There were two main wheeled layouts, 6x6 and 8x8. The lighter six-wheel all-terrain vehicles, initially also designed as gun tractors, gained a new direction in the mid-1960s. In 1966, following the PERM incident, Grachev oversaw the construction of the Peyu-1, a search and rescue vehicle. It was a six-wheel amphibious machine with a lightweight steel frame, a fiberglass body, a 180-horsepower Zill 375 engine, a hydromechanical gearbox, a transfer case, planetary reduction gears, and independent torsion suspension on the front and rear axles. A 3.5-ton crane was mounted on its cargo deck, and on water the vehicle moved using a water jet. The machine easily crossed two-meter trenches and exceeded all expectations. Yet, it never entered mass production. Internal conflicts at Zill played a role. Director Pavel Borodin and Grachev had a strained relationship, and Borodin was also under pressure to meet the plant's industrial quotas. Adding an entirely new line of vehicles threatened those numbers. So when Grachev asked for approval to produce just 30 units of the PAU-1 for the space program, Borodin refused. Officially, Zill claimed it had no resources to manufacture the vehicle. Only 13 units of the PU-1 were built. In 1969, the Bureau produced another prototype, the Zill 132A, a multi-purpose amphibious army vehicle based on the same components, but with a simpler mechanical gearbox. That one remained a single prototype, and so did the next machine, the PU-2, unveiled in 1970, though it was an even more striking design. The PU-2 was built on the basis of earlier heavy-duty designs, and its sheer size was astonishing. Nearly 12 meters long, over 3 meters wide and tall, power came from two large V8 engines, one driving each side of the vehicle. Its gigantic wheels with lightweight fiberglass rims allowed it to float over deep snow like a moose walking across virgin drifts. On land, it could reach speeds of up to 73 kilometers per hour, while on water, it cruised at around 10 kilometers per hour, carrying up to 10 people. Inside, it offered remarkable comfort for such a machine. Multiple heaters, air conditioning borrowed from a luxury limousine, and even a wood-burning stove in case the crew had to spend days stranded in the wilderness. The vehicle passed all trials successfully, but every time it traveled on public roads, it required special authorization from the traffic police. Worse still, it was too large to fit inside any military transport aircraft. As a result, it became clear that while the PU-2 offered unmatched comfort, autonomy, and off-road capability, it was simply too impractical for search and rescue missions. Development therefore continued in search of a more balanced design. In November 1972, SKB engineers built what is now considered the first prototype of the Bluebird, the Zill 
49,042. It was a lightweight amphibious vehicle with a fiberglass body and a powerful V8 engine capable of carrying two tons of cargo. Despite its size, it was compact enough to be transported by military aircraft, and it even had creature comforts like heaters, food, and water supplies for three days, and a small television set for the crew. On land, it could reach 80 kilometers per hour, while on water it moved at about 9 kilometers per hour using a water jet. Just a few years later, in 1975, the first real Bluebird vehicles were completed in two versions. The cargo model Zill 4906, nicknamed the Crane, and the passenger version Zill 49061, known as the Salon. The passenger vehicle was designed specifically for rescuing cosmonauts. Four crew seats plus three stretchers, with medical equipment, climate control, and supplies for three days of autonomous operation. The Bluebird series combined advanced off-road engineering with real practicality. It had enormous ground clearance, independent suspension on all wheels, disc brakes, central tire pressure control, and dual steering axles for better maneuverability. In water, it used twin propellers instead of a water jet, giving more reliability. On land, it could reach 75 kilometers per hour. On water, about eight kilometers per hour. Built on a lightweight aluminum frame with a fiberglass body, the vehicles were designed to fit inside IL-76 and in 12 transport aircraft, as well as MI-6 and Mi-26 helicopters. Despite being heavier than the early prototypes, the Bluebird represented the peak of Soviet off-road rescue engineering. It could cross deep snow, swamps, and sand, climb out of ditches, and reach places where no ordinary vehicle could. But there was still one question left. Why build a heavy cargo version alongside the rescue vehicle? The answer was surprising. Its main job was not only to carry equipment, but to transport a giant screw-propelled machine. If the wheeled all-terrain vehicles reached their limits, the final stage of the rescue mission was left to a truly unusual machine the screw-propelled Snow Swamp vehicle. By the late 1970s, Grachyov's design bureau had gained valuable experience with this technology. Instead of building another massive and hard-to-transport giant like the Zill 4904, they created a compact version, the Zill 2906. This machine moved on enormous rotating screws, which allowed it to literally drill its way through snow, swamps, and forest debris. The driver could move it not only forward or backward, but also sideways, turn in place, or climb steep, snowy slopes. With a lightweight aluminum body, a fiberglass cabin, and two engines, the Zill 2906 could reach 25 kilometers per hour and run for up to four hours, enough to cover around 100 kilometers in deep snow. Thus, the Complex 490 was born. Two agile wheeled vehicles and one light screw propelled machine. All three were equipped with modern radio systems and could maintain constant communication with each other, the transport aircraft, and the cosmonaut crew. The complex ensured that the landing site would be found, no matter where the capsule came down. In 1981, the Bluebird vehicles officially entered service with the Soviet search and rescue units. Sadly, their creator, Vitaly Grachyov, never lived to see it. In December 1978, just days before the new year, he passed away at the age of 75. After his death, the Bureau kept working. By the late 1980s, several dozen vehicles had been built, both wheeled and screw-propelled. But the original purpose was slowly fading spacecraft became more reliable, and landing capsules more precise. The Bluebird never had to show its full potential in its intended role. Instead, it proved itself elsewhere, in rescue missions, in the oil industry, in agriculture, and even during the devastating Armenian earthquake of 1988. After the Soviet collapse, the Bureau's future seemed uncertain, 
but it survived. In 1992, it was reborn as Vezdakod G. Fia, named after Gracioff himself. The vehicles were modernized, even fitted with diesel engines, something Gracioff would have surely opposed. The company operated until 2016, and many of the Bluebirds are still in service today. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this story, please support it with a like and a comment. It really helps keep this channel alive and inspires new videos. See you next time. Переход от индивидуального, разового выпуска к серийному производству, конечно, позволит намного снизить стоимость изготовления. И если такое решение...